So please welcome to the screen, Joanne Pelletier. Thank you, Brun. Um, thank you, everyone. And I feel, I feel so uh, moved and honored to be telling a story with um, these extraordinary storytellers. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege. So she said we should just go down and meet him. She, my mom, insisted that we leave our seats in a massive concert arena to go down to the stage to meet Les Brown, the uh, famous clarinetist and saxophonist and band leader from the big band era. Um, he and his musicians, by the way, were called Les Brown and his band of renown. They were a huge, big deal. And I know this because the first vinyl records I ever heard were the big band sounds from the 40s. My parents loved that stuff. It's part of my musical DNA, I guess. We're at this concert, not just to see Les Brown, no. We're also there to see Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. They're doing their last tour. It's Montreal, it's the 1970s. This show is being recorded for television. So there are massive gaps where we're just sitting around and it's during one of these gaps that my, my mom says, yeah, we should just go down and meet him now. And she grabs my hand and holds it tight and, and I look up and I don't really wanna go. And she means we're not gonna go meet Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, her idols. No, no, we're gonna go, go meet my idol, Les Brown. And she says, come on, if you don't try, you'll never know. Let's go get inspired. Inspired. Because back then I played the clarinet and the saxophone and I knew a lot of Les Brown's music, but look, to be clear, I had no talent whatsoever. And, and I was a fan, but wait, we're going to go down and meet Les Brown. Like, what am I going to say to him? I say to her, and how are we going to get all the way down there past security to the stage? That can't work. And also, by the way, what if we meet Bob Hope and Bing Crosby? What am I supposed to say then? And she says, don't worry about it. We leave my dad sitting in our designated seats. She grips my hand. I don't really have a choice. I, I follow her. She pulls me behind her and I see her striding past security, talking her way past handlers, movie, uh, TV cameras, uh, crowds of people. If she was stopped and questioned, she just calmly said, this is my daughter and she plays the saxophone and the clarinet. And I think it would be good if she could meet Les Brown, if you don't mind. And they would just let her go. And then in minutes, we're there. We're there at the stage near the orchestra pit. Masses of people everywhere and TV cameras. And I can see the musicians and I can see the instruments and it's all the stuff I love. And oh my God, I can see Bob Hopi staring right at me. But more importantly for me, I can see Les Brown. He's standing right there and he's looking at his sheet music, yeah. And my mom grips my hand again and says, would you please stand up straight? <sighs> mom. And I do, of course. And she calls out calmly, you know, not missing a beat. Excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Brown, Mr. Les Brown. I'd like to introduce you to someone. Do you have a minute? I'd like a word. This happened a lot with my mom. She would often go back uh, over well past what was allowed or obvious. And I was really shy and introverted and um, sure to my eyes when she did this kind of thing. Yeah, she was kind of bold and courageous and independent like everyone said she was. And I thought, yeah, okay. And I was sort of in awe of her because she was a bit of a rule breaker, but honestly, mostly I was embarrassed. And um, I was like a constantly mortified teenager around her, even before I was a teen. She was a force. I could not be anything like her. And that night, I met Les Brown. I shook his hand. I got a picture of myself with Les Brown. I met the whole band, the whole band of renown. Yeah. 
And I remember this episode 40 years later, but in a very different place. 40 years later, I'm at Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana. This is the Midwest of the United States, and I'm here for a tour of the Notre Dame football stadium. This is a kind of mecca for college football fans, really any football fan. And I'm here visiting friends, but really I'm here trying to write a story about sports, about how a passion about sports can lead us to a different world. Sure, I, I still love music, but now my life is really about stories and often sports, often boxing. But this tour of Notre Dame Stadium, it's a huge big deal, booked months in advance, kind of equal to meeting Les Brown, I guess. But my flight is late. I get to the stadium late. I miss my designated spot on the tour. There's nothing I can do. Everything is locked. I stand around. I hover around the gate to the stadium and I, I see a gate attendant and I go over to talk to him. I don't have a game plan in mind. I just think maybe I could talk to him and, and come up with something. Uh, maybe I could capture some of the mystique that I've missed because I can't get in the stadium. And, and we talk and it's a really warm conversation and minutes become 30 minutes, a half hour. And we talk about football in Notre Dame. And I, I tell them how extraordinary it is, you know, when you really love something and something really inspires you, um, it can take you to this other world. And I tell them all about boxing, of course, because that's the sport I really know and I love. And it's 45 minutes and he says, excuse me, would you just wait a minute? I'll be right back. And I say, I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like I've just monopolized your time and this is silly and I should just go back to my hotel. And he says, no, 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 you, you should wait right here. And he returns about 10 minutes later with a colleague, the head tour guide of Notre Dame. They offer me a private tour of the stadium. They say, you just seem so nice and you came all this way. And well, we enjoyed the conversation. I heard about it, you know, and I think it would be nice if you could come in. And so I can't believe it. I say, yes, of course. And I'm texting my friends to tell them. And they say, that's extraordinary. That never, ever happens to get into the stadium after the designated hours. And so there in minutes, I'm in that inner sanctum of the football stadium. I get to see everything. The players are not there, but I'm in the players' locker rooms. I see the uniforms and the trophies and the air is thick with this, just decades and decades of sports history. They tell me every story. It's a place I love. <laughs> and I get to walk the storied hallway from the players' locker room to the stadium. And right before the players go on the field, they look up at a sign on the wall. It says, play like a champion today. Each player taps the sign before they go onto the field. It's a ritual for luck, for inspiration. If you're not a football player, you're not supposed to touch the sign. Yeah, I, I touch the sign. <laughs> I get a photo of myself touching the sign rule breaker. Yeah. And it's in that moment, incomprehensibly, the memory stored away somewhere of me and Les Brown and my mom comes back. The minute I touched that sign, I thought of her and the happy, stunning memory of that night meeting my idol, Les Brown. I've heard often, especially now as I get older, that as we age, we can catch ourselves sounding a lot like our parents. <laughs> Way back then, I, I never felt anything like her. But I had noticed before that day at Notre Dame, as I was talking about inspiration, I caught myself sounding every bit like I remember her. Like the day we met Les Brown. She wasn't a football fan. 
but she sure understood inspiration. She would have so loved the adventure of that day. Are we alike? She and I, we're always like DNA. <laughs> Two disparate strands, very different and connected. I am nothing like her and I am everything like her. I miss you, mom. Thank you.